and tonight a very 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 exciting program we will have a live telephone interview with john m newman the author of the book which is out has been talked about for months already it's finally out on the shelves for the last uh, week or so i got a copy this afternoon called jfk and vietnam deception intrigue and the struggle for power john newman uh, well, it's extolled on the back by uh, William Colby, uh, former CIA director, and by David Lifton, author of Best Evidence, by Oliver Stone, who uh, John Newman worked with as one of the advisors for the film JFK, and by Peter Dale Scott, one of the uh, the uh, dean, one of the deans, one of the early researchers on the. JFK uh, assassination. JFK and Vietnam by John Newman. The argument has in general been uh, one of the main or the, the main or the reason that JFK was assassinated was because he was planning to pull out of Vietnam and that as soon as Johnson took over within uh, a couple of days the Vietnam policy was reversed from pull out to go in and this has been uh, a subject of great controversy whether or not JFK was planning to pull out or not, called a myth, uh, called a lie, uh, called a, a fantasy, uh, called the truth, and in general people have been uh, citing and waiting for this book, JFK and Vietnam. John Newman? Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for, it's three o'clock in the morning where you are. I'm drinking copious amounts of coffee. Okay, well, we appreciate your um, staying up or getting up for us. And I got your book uh, this afternoon, and I studied it assiduously, and now an, an expert, sort of. <clears throat> but it's a uh, fantastically detailed, step-by-step -step, uh, study of JFK and Vietnam. Uh, first, um, questions about your background. Who are you and where do you come from? Well, I've been working with this particular subject matter for a long time. Um, I have three degrees in East Asian studies. Anyone who would attempt to study the history of East Asia, particularly after World War II, uh, must understand the Vietnam War. Uh, I progressively became more interested in the seeming parallels or contradictions between the policy Kennedy was pursuing and that Johnson was pursuing. And we'll talk about that more. Um, I began teaching about 10 years ago um, courses on East Asian history and, and the Vietnam War. Where? Um, for the University of Maryland. I'm also in the military. And in the course of, of my service, I've I've taught in the evenings uh, in the overseas campuses of the University of Maryland and the back here in the Washington area. And you're a major? Yes, I am. And uh, you have worked in military intelligence? Yes, I am. I must tell you this, though. What uh, my, my military background really gives me no um, authority or credence in what I say in, in matters academic, and I never worked... Uh, on Vietnam uh, for the military as a problem. So it really, and whatever it is that I have to say, um, of course, does not reflect the, the views of the Army or of any government organization. Uh, what uh, started you? Uh, you've been working on this project, uh, JFK in Vietnam, for, was it 10 years? Yeah, well, it, it, as I was indicating, probably longer than that um, in a generic sense, maybe 15 years, um, as I began to to understand that the idea that has dominated what little literature there is, and there isn't a great deal on Kennedy in Vietnam, and that dominant view was that um, Johnson continued Kennedy's policies, as I began to suspect uh, that that might not be true, and that might be eight or nine or ten years ago, I became more focused on some of these issues. And then finally, at the doctoral level, um, and my degrees are from George Washington University, I'll mention that. At, when I got to the doctoral level and began to consider the dissertation, 
um, I spent a year um, taking a look at, at the evidence. Because when one submits a topic, there has to be sufficient evidence um, to adduce if one would overturn or, or attempt to change prevailing interpretations. In the course of that year, I was convinced uh, the evidence was very strong. I submitted my proposal about five years ago and uh, began in earnest four years ago to try and collect all the documents and interview those still living uh, on this subject and uh, finally completed um, my project uh, over the course of last summer and uh, wrote both my dissertation and the book. Uh, the dissertation I defended uh, successfully last December. <laughs> so you are a, a doctor of... Uh, Philosophy. Philosophy in uh, South, what, Asian studies? Well, Modern Far Eastern History is the name of the precise name of the degree program. Did you have um, any um, questions about when you started the uh, research? Did you have any questions or opinions that were leading you into it? Because this is a very, very prodigious study that you've done. Well, um, as I already indicated, I think uh, one of the points of focus was um, what about this question of of JFK and LBJ and and their respective policies on Vietnam? Uh, was it continuity or reversal? That was one sort of lightning rod. And um, to to a certain extent, I think I I had um, some preconceived notions about Kennedy. I I tended to view him. Uh, more positively than I do now. And that's not to, to say that, that I view him in strictly negative terms, strictly positive terms. Now, I think um, the research has tempered um, my view of Kennedy. He's, uh, he's now more of a sort of a real human being with flaws and foibles, um, some very noble aspects, and, and then um, also just a, a politician like many others who, who sought to do what he could to... Um, remain in power. Uh, and you were an advisor to Oliver Stone in his book, uh, his book, his movie, uh, JFK. This is true. Okay. Well, we'll get to the heart of the matter. Um, was JFK pulling out? Was JFK going in? It, w where is the mythology? Well, I'll try and be very clear in the course of this interview about what is fact and what is a theory, whether it be mine or or Oliver's or or Oliver's critics. Um, it is a fact that at the time Kennedy was murdered in Dallas, he was already in the course of withdrawing from Vietnam. Well, we know about his statement that he was going to pull out a thousand people by seven uh, by s the end of '63. But the criticism comes in the first he put in twenty thousand, and he's going to pull out a thousand. Big deal. Second, there are a list of uh, bellico bellicose quotations about uh, supporting Jim and kicking out the communists and not letting. Uh, uh, I'm giving giving support to the uh, effort to not letting the communists take over Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera, that are that are dem used to demonstrate that Kennedy was not going to be pulling out. Well, you have just um, that's a mouthful, Roy. Uh, yes, the whole uh, number of things there that that we need to slow down and take a look at very carefully. Once you put them under the microscope, I think. This is not as simple an issue as people have tried to make it out to be. Uh, first of all, Kennedy never made any statement that he was pulling a thousand guys out. Yes, he did. I have it on tape, a quotation. We were pulling a thousand troops out by the end of the year. Um, is this a press conference? Yes. Or is this the White House statement of 2 October? It's a press conference, it's his voice, it's his image on videotape. Right, but if you look very carefully at that, I think you'll see that uh, what he's saying is that this is a recommendation, and that's his understanding that that's what's in the recommendation, and that they will be looking at that further, but that it does not represent an unequivocal statement. One has to be very careful, you see, because 
um, in his order, and in fact, we might start with that, the, what is the hard evidence that he was pulling out? The hard evidence, um, quite apart from the, uh, the public statements which you mentioned, and then the private ones which uh, those who have tried to take the subject on have, have read about, Mansfield and Morse and others, um, he signed a presidential directive on the 5th of October, 1963, NSAM 263. NSAM stands for National Security Action Memorandum, the presidential directives that were called NSAMs in those days. Um, that NSAM is unequivocal evidence that the decision had been taken, had been made and implemented. It also, however, contained a provision for keeping it secret. Keeping, and, and what was being kept secret wasn't so much that they were thinking about it, because that had been announced formally on the steps of the White House by McNamara, uh, but in less than, than unequivocal terms. Now, the NSAM itself contained a provision for keeping the fact of the decision, the fact of implementation, secret. And therefore, when you look at those press conferences, and, and what you're referring to is probably one of them, there are more than one, um, Kennedy is, is less than... Um, forthcoming in, in revealing that, in fact, um, this, this decision is final, that has been made. And there are reasons for that, and we can explore that. So that's, I start off with that. Well, I wish I brought the tape with me. Um, as, as I remember, he simply says, we will be withdrawing 1,000 troops by the end of the year, period. Not, I, we think of it, we think we're going to, or... We may, but we are going to be withdrawing a thousand troops, and I think this was related to that uh, NSAM 263. But it was a public statement on film, and and I have a, the audio. Maybe uh, when we take a break, I'll go ahead and pull that statement out here and and read it because I have it here. You have it. Yeah. Okay. You have about everything <laughs> with with reference to this. So. Um, one of the things that you mention in the book is that, uh, or one of your summary statements, is that Kennedy was surrounded by advisors who were trying to get into the war, and he was resisting. The, the, um, the, the evidence for this is, is overwhelming. Um, it, it begins at the beginning, in early 1961, um, first with Laos, and, uh, and we're talking April, May, March, April, May of 1961. And in, in late April, at the end of April, beginning from that point in Vietnam, and throughout the rest of that year uh, in Vietnam and, and Laos, all of Kennedy's senior advisors... Uh, to be distinguished, say, from Cassandra's like Chester Bowles, a number two at the State Department, or our ambassador to India, Galbraith, who uh, did not um, take these proposals kindly, did not look upon them kindly. All the other senior advisors in the, in the administration, one by one, came on board to this idea that we, the situation was so bad that the only thing that could be done and should be done was to send U.S. combat troops to Vietnam and or Laos. That's what they wanted to do, and Kennedy was resisting. But he did send, was it 20,000 uh, advisors? Well, by the time he died, there were about 16,000. When he took off, when he became president, there were about 880. Um, the context of that decision, to that is to increase our advisory presence in Vietnam. And that decision is known as NSAM 111, uh, dated sort of prophetically 20 uh, November 1961. Uh, the context of that decision was whether or not to send combat troops. And by that time, uh, there was, uh, I would say, almost complete unity. Rusk, McNamara, the Joint Chiefs, most of their, their deputies. Um, there was practically complete unity uh, in, in the civilian and military leadership um, that advised the president that, that this had to be done. Um, and I like to talk about that because of what's going on in this 
firestorm of controversy after the film, um, I've seen it in more than one place. That uh, well, we don't know uh, what Kennedy would have done if the situation was bad. Um, had he had he lived and faced the same situation that uh, Lyndon Johnson did, uh, he might have he might have done it too. Uh, after all, he never faced the situation that Johnson did. That you, you see that argument um, being you know, being being advanced now in, in order to attack the idea uh, that Kennedy was a drawn or wouldn't have put in combat troops. And this record of 1961, which is um, robust as a record, um, suggests to me that those who advance that just are totally ignorant of the record. You see, because he did face the precise situation that Johnson faced in 64, 65, the precise arguments that were given by the same advisors, incidentally, to Johnson, Rusk, McNamara, Rostow, others. To wit, the situation in, in late 1961 was put to him in this way. It was the, the battlefield situation was dire. The fate of South Vietnam hung in the balance. Critical U.S. interests were at stake regionally and globally. And nothing short of the in, introduction, nothing short of the introduction of several U.S. combat divisions could save the day or turn it around. In that context, the president said no, and in that context later Johnson would say yes. In that context he said, okay, what I am willing to do is to increase uh, our advisory presence and send more military equipment. So you see, it isn't an issue at, at this time, and for most of the administration until we get to the very end, it is not an issue of... Uh, being soft on communism necessarily, um, we are going to respond to the communist challenge or threat in South Vietnam. The question is how? And the key issue was whether or not to make this an American war or whether to support South Vietnamese efforts. So one, when one says, as people do, well, Kennedy deepened our commitment, and that's true. He certainly did. A lot of advisors from 800 to 16,000 over the course of those three years. A lot of equipment, some aircraft flown by uh, American pilots uh, with Vietnamese riding in the back seat. Uh, armored personnel carriers, money, other weapons. Um, nonetheless, never uh, would he cross the line of a to make that an American war, to put American combat divisions, American combat soldiers in the line of fire in Vietnam. But um, my remembrance from your book is that uh, during his uh, presidency, Kennedy was already lying to the American people about, say, the extent of American Air Force involvement in the war and the fact that uh, Americans were uh, conducting an air war against the Vietnamese. Uh, they were, they'd get some uh, non-com Vietnamese soldier and stick him in the back of the plane and call it uh, American advisors uh, teaching and helping and, and advising the, the South Vietnamese or the Traitor Vietnamese. I don't know where to go. The uh, the uh, the Vietnamese against uh, the Vietnamese. Um, it gets yes, very complicated. It, it, I call this a sort of an official deception, uh, and it's been acknowledged in, even in um, Department of Defense histories. Uh, there's one uh, written by the Army called the. Uh, um, I believe the title is the U.S. Media in the Vietnam War, 19. Um, 60 to 72, I'm not really sure, I can't remember the exact dates on it. Anyway, it covers most of our involvement. And in fact, uh, the official optimism uh, was the policy. And, uh, and more than that, uh, it is true, and there's no doubt about this, that um, an attempt was made to, to keep the extent of our participation in that war from the American public um, this was known to the president. He approved of it, 
and and didn't like it when when uh, reporters found found out things and put them in the newspapers that suggested we uh, we were active, uh, and in particular the air war was a sensitive matter because after all there were American pilots flying those planes, dropping ordnance. Um, but it's a, it was a broader thing than that. Uh, anything that seemed to suggest uh, Amer- an American role in fighting uh, was uh, very upsetting if it appeared in the newspapers. And as a result, uh, there were memoranda generated uh, at high levels in the State Department uh, in the Pentagon, um, which talked about or uh, tried to confine uh, what it was that uh, reporters were allowed to see. Yes, this did go back uh, fairly early. Uh, in fact, when Kennedy comes in, it is a, an entirely a covert war. Uh, the advisors, the Green Berets, are are under the the operational direction of the CIA, uh, both in Laos and in Vietnam, and that will change. Uh, that that control will um, revert to the to the Pentagon by the end of the presidency in an operation called Switchback. Um, so it, it it begins as a secret war. And as our involvement deepens, uh, it becomes more of a problem to maintain it as such. Uh, but there isn't any doubt that the president himself uh, is is part of that and is, understands what's going on. Hmm. And then there's the problem here again that Kennedy was being lied to by his advisors as to what was going on in Vietnam. That's a developing problem. Uh, not one certainly that that exists in 1961, for example. And I like 1961 for that because there is no um, discrepancies in the reporting and, and sort of um, inside at the top secret level of the meetings and briefings that are given to the president and and others um, uh, given to, say, for example, military uh, commanders in the field. Um, the, the record is unequivocal, it's clear, there's no deception duplicity uh, at, in, at the inside level in 1961. Um, however, in 1962, that becomes a developing problem. And, of course, the background for that is NSAM 111, which we just talked about, Kennedy's decision not to send combat troops and to instead uh, increase uh, our... Uh, efforts to advise the South Vietnamese uh, to handle the war themselves. Um, most of the, certainly most of the military leadership at the time felt that that wouldn't work, and we have a number of memoranda. That that would not work? Yeah, that it would not work. And these memoranda aren't new, by the way. They're in the Pentagon Papers. Uh, the Joint Chiefs, um, well, there was a, 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 I believe in December after NSAM 111, there was a, uh, uh, a group of uh, senior uh, generals in the Pentagon that uh, met to consider the policy, and they they wrote the president that uh, they wrote to McNamara that the presently um, considered measures uh, will prove to be inadequate. Um, after all, they had made the argument that nothing short of putting in combat troops would work, and so um, there was a feeling early on. In 1962, I would say a disappointment that what, what it is that we were trying to do, i.e., uh, confine ourselves to an advisor role, would not be successful. Um, in, in any event, uh, a new organization is created in Vietnam to carry out Kennedy's plan. It's called MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Of later years Vietnam fame, uh, General Westmoreland became the commander later on, but at that time, the, the MACV's first commander was General Harkins. This is early 1962, and one of the first things they had to do um, was get a handle on who the hell were fighting out there. How many of them are there? Uh, what's the span of their control? Uh, we didn't know enough about that. As Secretary McNamara found out in February at one of his conferences in the Pacific, um, when he asked how many bad guys there were, uh, he got a, a series of, of uh, conflicting figures all of which, or most of which, appeared to be very bad uh, and appeared to be too high in terms of the capability of the South Vietnamese Army to handle them. So that became the top priority right off the bat for MACV. 
uh, to understand the, the nature and size of the enemy. Um, experts were pulled from, from everywhere uh, in Washington, in, in Honolulu, and sent to augment uh, MACV's new intelligence um, capabilities out there. And this study was done and completed early on in the 62 um, by about mid-April. And what they found um, uh, was very startling, uh, that, uh, in fact, the Viet Cong hardcore forces uh, uh, may have included as many as 40,000 um, soldiers, which would have required uh, a South Vietnamese regular army close to 400,000 just to handle it. And at the time, the South Vietnamese army was uh, about 150, ex trying to expand to 170,000 and having uh, much difficulty doing it. So it, it was even less than half the size uh, that it would have had to have been to contain such an enormous uh, threat on the battlefield. Now, the this information uh, was a problem, because what it meant was that the, the American uh, ongoing effort in Vietnam uh, would fail. It would not work. And everyone knew that Kennedy had, you know, and if, it, if that were true, there were only two options left, withdrawal or send in the combat troops. And everyone knew uh, that Kennedy had already drawn that line, that he would not go across it. So sending that information forward... Um, really meant only one thing. It would have forced the president to face the music, and, and, and it could possibly have led to an early decision on withdrawal. That information was blocked, and it was changed. And in its place, a false story of success on the battlefield uh, was sent forward to McNamara and from him to Kennedy. And this continued uh, down to the, to the end of Kennedy's presidency, um, uh, but in the end, Kennedy understands it, but he doesn't for a long time. And therefore, um, I, in, when I discuss this in the book, as a deception within a deception, the first level being what we talked about, uh, i.e. keeping the nature and extent of our involvement uh, from the public. But at, at the at top secret level inside the government, there, there evolves a second echelon, a second level of deception, which is to hide the, failing, the facts of the failing battlefield situation of the president himself uh, over the course of 1962. Now, maybe I've talked too much. No. <laughs> you can't talk too much because you're the interviewee with all the information here. Um, so... We have this, um, Kennedy's not being told the truth by his advisors. The American people aren't being told the truth by Kennedy. And um, there is the general uh, description of this damn war in Vietnam as being a time when the war was actually not conducted by the president. The, the war wasn't being conducted by the, the Pentagon the war was being conducted by covert forces, and they were manipulating everybody. Well, the for I don't know about covert forces. I mean, the war was being conducted, uh, what little they were conducting, by South Vietnamese units. Um, the problem with how they were conducting the war is this. Uh, and as I indicated, the size of the Viet Cong was enormous by this point. Um, and there... The morale was very poor in the South Vietnamese Army. And in fact, by the end of 1960, there, there are a few examples where uh, they did try and take on the Viet Cong uh, in a serious way, um, particularly in the summer of 62. Uh, but those battles were on, inconclusive. And, and uh, I must tell you that, that most of the operations um, that, conducted by the South Vietnamese Army were either very ineffective or, in most instances, totally false. Um, in other words, and they would they would use the intelligence developed uh, by some of the, the fine American efforts that were going on out there. To, they would use that intelligence to go where the Viet Cong were not. <sighs> Walks in the sun, they were called. And it, there's there's been a lot written on this uh, at the time. Halberstam, Sheen, Homer, Vigart, a lot of the reporters began to catch wind of this, and there were. You see, and the reason they knew was because some of the American advisors uh, just didn't didn't like what was going on, didn't believe and knew that the story of success was not true and made waves about it, tried to send reports for it. In fact, Neil Sheehan's book has captured this particular part of the story very well, I think. 
which book? Uh, Bright Shining Lie. It's a it's a, a biography of uh, John Paul Van, who was an American advisor, a lieutenant colonel at the time, operating in the southern area of Vietnam. Anyway, uh, Sheehan's book does a good job in giving you a sense of what it was like um, to be an American advisor in this failing effort trying to galvanize South Vietnamese units to go fight the enemy, and they really didn't want to. And uh, of what happened to him for for trying to tell the truth about it. Now, one of the things I didn't see in uh, my uh, not complete look at your book, which I've only had for a few hours, but I've heard somebody mention that uh, you discussed that LBJ was getting better information about the Vietnamese situation than Kennedy was. Yeah, it's a good time to to, to uh, address this. And we haven't gotten into 63 yet, uh, and, and we, we must do that because there lies the, some of the more, most crucial points when one discusses uh, what, what Kennedy was doing and would have done. But in connection with this, um, this problem in the reporting in 1962, you see there's, there's another very disturbing um, set of facts, a set of documents. Um, we know from the documentary record uh, there are a series of memoranda being sent to the vice president over the course of 62. In fact, uh, beginning uh, right at the period we were just discussing when um, this, our, our view of the, of the battlefield was being uh, developed. And these memoranda lay out very clearly um, how the war is failing, not just conceptually, but in terms of uh, facts and figures number of enemy battalion operations, number of desertions from the South Vietnamese Army, and so forth. In other words, at a time when a McNamara is being told in conferences uh, that he's going uh, out to Honolulu and Saigon for, that we're winning and being shown facts and figures to substantiate that viewpoint, a different view, an opposite view, um, is being presented to the vice president. Now, I find that absolutely incredible. I mean, can you imagine today or at any other time the, the president and the vice president being briefed differently on a major foreign policy question such as this, where Ameri the lives of American soldiers are, are involved? Now, who was briefing the vice president? Well, these memoranda were written by his, his military representative. Uh, an Air Force colonel by the name of Burris. And, and LBJ was withholding this information from JFK. Um, we don't know that that's a fact. What we do know is that there is no record, no document, which would suggest that he uh, did inform the, uh, the president. He makes no claim um, to having had different information or having told uh, Kennedy about it in his memoir. It would appear not. Hmm. Uh, gosh, well, it was the um, the situation where early on, I'm not sure if it was 61 or 62, Kennedy was intent on formulating a policy declaration while Lyndon Johnson was in Vietnam talking to Jim, and Kennedy was intent on getting the statement and the policy made before Lyndon Johnson came back from Vietnam. So there seems to be a, uh, an intense competition already brewing between these two people. Well, I don't think it's, in, it's any news that Kennedy and Johnson didn't like each other. Uh, those who have read uh, about, the, about both of these men and, and, uh, and the politics of that period know that. What you have just mentioned, however, is a, a very interesting chapter in the book, a couple of chapters. It's an in, 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 and it's, a, it's, it's one of these sort of lost episodes in what little lit literature exists. And um, I was in absolutely incredulous uh, when I began to delve into this. We're talking about the, the vice president's trip to Vietnam in early 61. So... Uh, you know, to sort of keep the 
context clear here for the listening audience, we're moving back now into early 61. Uh, for the past few minutes, we've been discussing what happened after Kennedy turned down com- the combat troops option and, and, and said, well, we'll stick with advisors, and then we get into this problem of, of deception in 62. But the point you're raising is, is very much earlier. Uh, Kennedy's only been in office for a few weeks, and um, the situation in Laos deteriorates and fails miserably. And so does the effort at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, we're talking April, late April, 1962. Excuse me, 1961. So the question becomes, um, in, in Southeast Asia, what to do in Vietnam? And right away the, the proposals are uh, to send combat troops, uh, the, pen, the proposals in the Pentagon, I should say. I, I don't think at this point um, the, the civilian leadership, Rusk, um, and the senior civilians in, in the Pentagon and elsewhere are um, sending memoranda uh, forward to do this. They will by the end of the year. But anyway, at this point, uh, the question becomes one of, uh, after the failure in Laos, uh, trying to uh, bolster the confidence in the rest of uh, U.S. allies that were shaken by the American performance in Laos, and that would be principally Thailand and South Vietnam, but also others, Taiwan, South Korea. Vice President Johnson was sent to East Asia, and he went to most of those countries to reassure them. Now, However, uh, back in Washington, the the proposal on the table, so to speak, is uh, uh, sending in American combat forces. But you can't do that without Diem's agreement. And he didn't want that. Not true. <laughs> so says the uh, <clears throat> some of the few books that uh, have uh, taken this one on. What I found um, was a quite different story. And we have... Uh, but, you know, and the funny thing is that, that most of the documents were available um, for years to unlock this little mystery. Uh, we do have one or two new ones uh, that have come out in the last years that sort of make the case stronger. But what happened was this. Um, Johnson went out um, with a letter from Kennedy to discuss um, various new American measures uh, to to. Uh, intensify the, the effort against the, the Viet Cong. Um, and these were uh, more money for expanding the South Vietnamese Army and um, a number of other measures for increasing U.S. military and economic aid. But not in, nowhere in this letter or the president's proposals uh, was there an idea of sending combat troops or a defense treaty. Now, uh, Johnson raised this issue with Diem anyway. And uh, some historians, only a couple that I know of, but they have tended to take the rest of the field with them, have suggested that this Kennedy ordered or charged Johnson to do this, to raise the issue of combat troops. Yeah, it's not true. In fact, when asked about it at a press conference, he tr- he sort of waffled on that. Uh, it's a very convoluted answer. And in fact, uh, after Johnson leaves, and while he's out there, Kennedy uh, uh, Polishes a, off a one of these presidential NSAMs, presidential directive, NSAM 52. Um, and it is based on a proposal to him uh, from, from his Vietnam task force. And in that proposal, there was specific language saying that uh, the Pentagon would make a study of uh, what U.S. combat troops should be sent to Vietnam after a discussion between Vice President Johnson and Diem about it. Well, Kennedy removed that, that sentence. Uh, he didn't want Johnson to bring that up. What we do know is that after Johnson arrived, uh, he received a top-secret cable uh, which contained uh, the proposal of the Joint Chiefs to send combat troops to Vietnam, and that proposal uh, stated uh, specifically that Diem should be encouraged to ask for them. So you see, uh, what we have is, is an ensign where Kennedy removes um, this idea of looking at it uh, as a result of a johnson Dem talk. And uh, Johnson brings it up anyway after having received uh, this, this cable, uh, which is a memorandum of the Joint Chiefs suggesting that he, that he encouraged Dem to do so. So the record suggests that it was not Kennedy who charged or ordered Johnson to discuss this subject uh, with Dem, that in fact Johnson was facil- facilitating something he knew 
that the Joint Chiefs wanted discussed with Diem. You see, that's what the record shows. Now, in connection with this, the history books uh, thus far have said uh, only that Johnson raised the issue with Diem, and Diem said no. And that's not true. What we do know is that Diem said yes. He, um, when Johnson raises the issue, Diem I don't really think that, that's necessary, but then on hand is General McGar, who says, well, what if we send American combat troops in there but use them for training? And Diem said yes. We know about this from ca- the cables that were sent back from the American embassy. So there was a formula worked out in Johnson's presence whereby U.S. combat troops would go to Vietnam and to which Diem agreed. Meanwhile, back in Washington, uh, Kennedy, as I said, had just uh, authored this NSAM, which uh, doesn't have any provision at all for his combat troops. He also schedules a review of his own NSAM uh, for about eight days later. And um, it's interesting that that review will also uh, be complete before Johnson returns. And it struck me as very interesting, since he had his vice president out there in Vietnam, talking to the president of South Vietnam, why would Kennedy um, sign the directive on what our policy in Vietnam would be then and review it prior to the president's return? Very interesting situation, and certainly not one that has been well reported on at all in, in those works that have tried to deal with the subject. Again, probably too lengthy of an answer, but it's a subject which is very detailed and, and uh, more complex than as your book is very detailed and complex, and actually with a cast of thousands talking about all the various actors, uh, the president and his advisors, and the uh, pro-war people, and Johnson and his advisors, and the the uh, military and their advisors, and the Vietnamese. It's really uh, quite uh, complex and amazing, very well detailed, and very well documented uh, adventure non-fictional adventure and uh i know you're a you're a specialist in this i've seen you in another interview and people asking you all kinds of questions having to do with the assassination and you're stipulating over again that you are you have studied jfk and vietnam and this is the area in which you have expertise and this is the area that you've studied and you are not always willing to comment or speculate on out, outside of your uh, specialized and very important area. Uh, but the question keeps coming up you know, for, for people looking at the assassination, uh, the role that Johnson may have had uh, either actively or as a knowing non-participant uh, in the assassination, and then one lo- one looks at the Vietnam policy and sees that uh, the National Security Action Memorandum 263 is uh, uh, obtains up to the day of the assassination, and then a couple of days later, Johnson, under the uh, the guise of continuing Kennedy's policy, conducts a reverse and starts talking in NSAM, I believe it was 273, about a victory, in achieving a victory in Vietnam, which is a complete reversal two days after the assassination. And so one looks at Vietnam as one of the reasons for the assassination and Johnson as one of the possible actors, or at least a knowing non-actor. Well, there, okay, again, this is a mouthful. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Subject- right. <laughs> um, it, it, NSAM 273 is not a complete reversal but it is uh, very much a reversal of major tenets of Kennedy's Vietnam policy. Um, But let me say this uh, to begin with. Yeah, I don't comment on on, uh, who killed John Kennedy, uh, the mechanics of the assassination. I am not persuaded there are enough facts to make such a statement. What I do say is that uh, the, and as far as this Vietnam business goes and the assassination, Look, this is a fact. Kennedy w- was withdrawing. Johnson reversed his policy in some aspects immediately and in other aspects more gradually. Nonetheless, he reversed Kennedy's policy in Vietnam. And, and therefore, the assassination leads directly to the escalation of the war in Vietnam. Uh, that much is just 
a part of the historical record as much as people would deny it. it it's just true. Whether or not Kennedy's had plans to withdraw, irrespective of whether he would have followed through or not, had he lived, whether or not those plans and his intent were part of the motive of the murder is a theory. At best, it is a theory. It is not a fact, but it's a theory. And I think it's it's a subject area which is legitimate. It's not paranoid. It's not un-American. Given the, the, the foreign policy reversal coincident with the death of the president, it's natural that this question should be looked into. And I wish that, that more than people who are exclusively focused on uh, mechanics of the assassination, um, I, t- I wish that that, that scholars and, and his historians and political scientists would come out of their ivory towers and take this one on, and that they would release the files, not just uh, you know assassination type files, but policy files, and uh, we could advance our understanding of this. But for me, see, I haven't heard anything yet, and I, it's I, I, I refuse to talk to Oliver about assassination advice him. I don't make public comments on it. Because I haven't seen anything yet where I think you could take somebody into a court of law and convict them. And so for me to go on a public radio station and say that Johnson uh, was the one who had Kennedy killed is is irresponsible. If I said that about you, you wouldn't like it uh, if I didn't have the facts to prove it. There are some interesting um, dilemmas we have here, and we've been talking about some of them. Uh, very unusual situations that uh, appear to be very uh, sort of sinister and, and not correct. Um, however, going beyond that and actually accusing someone of being uh, of having ordered a murder or being com- uh, having had complicity in it is a different kettle of fish. But I do think that is it, it is uh, a legitimate field of inquiry and, and one that we naturally would be pursued in, in the case of a murder. Now, that's for starters. These other things that you've talked about, these, these NSAMs and NSAM 273, um, I think are crucial in making the case for what reversal occurs uh, immediately. We are on the phone live as of February 19th, 1992, with John M. Newman, the author of JFK and Vietnam. Deception, Intrigue, and the Struggle for Power. This is the book that people have been talking about for months. We got I'm talking with John Newman, who is a specialist in on the subject, JFK and Vietnam. His book is uh, extremely detailed, highly documented, and uh, about 400, uh, over 450 pages of the, uh, on the, this specific subject, and uh, cannot be dismissed lightly. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think let's get into these NSAMs, 263 and 273. You know, there, I've seen practically nothing um, in, in the newspapers and all the firestorm now that is correct. An awful lot of garbage, an awful lot of things that are partially true. You know, the only person that, that I really have a lot of respect for in the work that, that he's done in this area is Peter Dale Scott. After all, he spent about six years, and this is early on, in fact, there's a chapter in Volume 5 of the Gravel edition of the Pentagon Papers that is authored by Peter, which I found to be uh, sort of amazingly accurate, um, given uh, the lack of documents at the time. But uh, it's very important to get this right. And when I found out uh, what Oliver was doing, and that uh, this question was going to be a major uh, part of the movie, uh, that's the... the principally the reason why I, I decided to try and help him to get it right because I knew that uh, this film would be viewed by literally millions and millions of people around the world and um, there was a, a lot of uh, things that had to be worked on to get it right um, I came in late on that project but let's talk about these presidential directives the one that Kennedy signed um, six weeks before uh, his death, and, and the one that Johnson signed a couple of days afterwards. 
I think we, we need to start with 263, which we mentioned at the top of the show, which is the, the order to begin the withdrawal. Now, prior to that, a few, a few days prior to that, uh, there was a White House statement. That White House statement was made um, as the result of a trip by Secretary of Defense McNamara and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Taylor. And um, essentially that, that statement uh, that is made says um, we're winning the war, which we were not, by the way, and that we could, um, one, withdraw a thousand men by the end of the year, and two, turn over all responsibility uh, in, uh, for the war effort, and, and our responsibilities were advisory uh, to the South Vietnamese by 1965. So what you have here, and, and by the way, when one looks at that statement, that White House statement, it's, it's very carefully worded. It says the war should have progressed to a point where 1,000 men could be withdrawn. Now that's a little bit different than saying it definitely has. It's, it's, there is in this proposition, in this statement, a sort of an if-then. Do you see what I mean? The war should have progressed to a point where 1,000 men could be withdrawn. It does not say the president has approved or the president uh, has said. What we have, this White House statement, is simply a recommendation from the Secretary of Defense, and this recommendation is an if-then proposition. What we have a few days later, however, at the top secret level, is a presidential directive which implements the withdrawal plan and has a provision to keep this secret. Um, we can go back and discuss all this, uh, how this came about, uh, and Kennedy's withdrawal plan, but right now I'm going to stay focused on these, on these crucial documents. What happens after this um, is a change in the military reporting. Um, we talked about the, the change in early 62 from um, the notion that we were losing the war and all of a sudden we're winning it, and we talked about some of the reasons for that. At this point... No sooner than Kennedy signs this, this withdrawal order, now all of a sudden he's being told, or going to be told very shortly, uh, that we're losing again. That's going to make it very difficult for him in, in this election campaign in 1964 to follow through. If, uh, in other words, if, if, if we're losing the war, how can you pull out? Not a very uh, uh, nice proposition to look forward to. In any event, this leads to a big conference in Honolulu. And the date of that conference is 20 November 1963, only two days before the assassination. At that conference, um, the, the military um, presents for the first time, I think, for the first time, a, a very critical view of the, of the battlefield situation. In other words, that the war is being lost, especially in, in, in the South, where most of the fighting is going on. Now, as a result of that conference, the proposals which emerge from it are escalatory. Um, in particular, a point of contention was um, to escalate uh, the war against North Vietnam, specifically uh, to include direct U.S. actions against North Vietnam, which is something that Kennedy had never been willing to do. Uh, he was always anxious to in increase uh, South Vietnamese efforts against North Vietnam, and had been since uh, the early weeks of his presidency in 1961. But the, the context here is the president signs this withdrawal order in, in October, and by 20 November, uh, what is being said is we're losing the war, and, and the war is going to have to be uh, escalated and, and include possibly U.S. actions against North Vietnam. Now, what we find is, in fact, and that meeting was extraordinary because uh, normally it was uh, McNamara and uh, uh, the Pacific commanders and the ambassador uh, that would attend these conferences. In this case, it included the Secretary of State, uh, Dean Rusk, and the President's National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy. Um, it was Bundy's job to return to Washington and take these uh, rather extraordinary proposals and to craft them into a new directive for the president to sign. 
Now, McGeorge Bundy knew, of course, uh, in great detail what Kennedy's policy was um, and, and what its fundamental tenets were, i.e., to keep it to keep to confine our role to an advisory role. So, what he did was to take those as those, uh, as I say, more escalatory proposals, and he put them into an NSAM, authored an, a, a new directive, uh, in which he tried to bring those proposals in line with what he thought Kennedy might be willing to approve. Therefore, in the passage of this draft directive, and you see, 273 was drafted for Kennedy, not Johnson, on the 21st of November, the day before the assassination. In any event, in, in that first... Well, wait, wait a second, this is a very important point that I haven't heard before. 273, which uh, is the first mention... Uh, that the U.S. is going to help the government of South Vietnam to win, that was drafted for Kennedy. Yes, it's drafted before the assassination. Kennedy, but it's it. I think it's uh, we've got to be very careful. But it's it's not drafted to say we're going to win. We're always trying to help them win. Okay? But it never said that this. It had never said before that the uh, object was to help the government to win. Oh, we always said that from square one. The key here is how to help them win. Does that how include U.S. combat troops and U.S. Uh, bombing, direct U.S. bombing of North Vietnam? No. What it does include is various measures by the South Vietnamese Army to win the war. You see, that's the issue. Not whether we wanted to help them win. Of course we wanted to help them win. The, the key issue was always how and, and what U.S. military force was to be used in this conflict, you see. Now... Um, indeed, we, you know, th this early draft that we're talking about now was only declassified in January of last year. And it's, uh, it was an extraordinary breakthrough uh, in, in, this, in, in this study uh, that, that we're doing on this period in the subject. Now, as I mentioned, um, what McGeorge Bundy had to do was to return from this conference, an extraordinary conference, and bring into line rather escalatory proposals, some aspects of which uh, Kennedy would not have approved, and bring them into line, uh, in, into an NSAM that, that he thought Kennedy might want to sign. So what he did, with respect to the crucial passage in NSAM 273, uh, where it talks about these actions against North Vietnam, is he put in a restrictive clause. And the, the draft of NSAM 263 very clearly shows that these actions will be confined to the use of South Vietnamese resources, South Vietnamese forces. You see, so this, this is something which uh, is totally in line with what Kennedy always wanted, which was for the South Vietnamese forces to take actions against North Vietnam. Well, um, Kennedy is assassinated the next day, and when NSAM 273 is signed by President Johnson, only four days later, Guess what? That restrictive clause is missing. It's been removed. Wow. And the door is now open wide for, for U.S. action against North Vietnam. That is a reversal, a major one, that occurs immediately, a coincident with uh, the death of the president. Now, the other issue of combat troops um, is not fully reversed until 1965. So there are some aspects of the reversal which are immediate and some which are more gradual. Now, there's another thing that we need to discuss here. What about the withdrawal plan? In, in, in the context of this discussion on these two documents, 263 and 273, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the way it works. Here's what the record really shows us. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, in October you had two things, really. You had a White House statement. And that White House statement isn't the pre uh, presidential statement. It's, it's a recommendation by the Secretary of Defense that the war should have improved to a point where we could withdraw a thousand guys and turn it over by 65. The other thing we have is this top secret order, the NSAM, which implements the withdrawal and is kept from the public. Now, NSAM 273, another passage in there, and by the way, this passage was in both the draft and the final version, has one sentence which mentions the withdrawal. This one sentence is very cleverly worded. It says that U.S. objectives with respect to withdrawal of forces from Vietnam remains the same as stated as the White House statement of 2 October. Now, what does this mean? 
In other words, it, it, first of all, it never mentions specifically the 1,000-man withdrawal. It okay. only mentions withdrawal generically. And second of all, it doesn't address NSAM 263. Which is 11 October. So it's saying that the uh, Correct. withdrawal... Correct. on the 5th of October, and it's dated the 11th. What, what it refers to, instead of the Kennedy's withdrawal order, refers to this, this recommendation by McNamara, which is an if-then proposition. Hmm. So you see, this is a very subtle point, but very significant. 273... Uh, is an inherent step backward from 263 by omission. Never mentions it. And instead mentions a, a much more ambiguous proposal by McNamara. So there are a number of these issues here, okay? With respect to withdrawal, uh, NSAM 273 is a step back because it never mentions 263. And, and why in the hell wouldn't uh, a top-secret presidential directive 273 mention the previous uh, presidential directive on Vietnam. That's that's funny. And the other issue is is reversal of Kennedy's policies. And the one which I have specifically zeroed in on here in the last couple of minutes is this whole, whole idea of, of what action should be taken against North Vietnam. And the issue was U.S. action or South Vietnamese action. And the, the draft uh, prepared for Kennedy uh, had a, a restrictive uh, sentence in there confining those actions to the, uh, the South Vietnamese. And at, right after the uh, the assassination, that restriction was removed. I discussed this uh, with McGeorge Bundy. He acknowledged to me his presence at Honolulu, uh, that it was his typewriter that drafted uh, upon which uh, that document was drafted. And I discussed with him the changes that were made um, in NSAM 273. And he told me that, uh, yes, he, he agreed those changes were made, uh, that they were uh, in the direction of, of a much stronger effort in the war, and that those changes reflected Johnson's stronger views about the war than Kennedy's, and that they were made on Johnson's orders. Okay, well, we're getting in detail here, but uh, you just stated that in uh, the National Security Action Memorandum 273, and it mentions the objectives of the United States with respect to the withdrawal of U.S. military personnel remain as stated in White House Statement of October 2nd, 1963. Right. Now, the Memorandum 263 is dated October 11th, right. not uh, October 2nd. Right. The decision was made on the 5th. Uh, and it says, as a meeting uh, at a meeting of uh, on October fifth, correct. The pre uh, in two sixty three, the president considered the recommendations contained in the report of McNamara and General Taylor on their mission to South Vietnam. Is that report of McNamara and General Taylor declassified? It has been for years. It has. Yes. So that is available to yes. researchers. Yes. No problem there. We understand what what they're recommending. And the fact that it mentions in 273 the uh, objective to help the uh, Vietnamese to win, the South Vietnamese to win, is not a, uh, a departure from previous policies. Oh, no. Uh, Kennedy was not in Vietnam to lose or to draw. Uh, American forces had been sent there, the advisors, all that money and equipment. Yeah, of course the idea was to win. It always was. The question was how. What American resources? Okay. Um, now, one of the criticisms that is made about the film, uh, the uh, some of the uh, the uh, researchers' um, points on the the assassination researchers' points, and I made in advance of publication of your book, is that this is an attempt to whitewash. JFK to make him look like a peacemaker, and uh, by by intimating that he was assassinated because he was going to withdraw from Vietnam, whereas he was just as bloodthirsty as any of the other politicians that we've had. That he had blood on his hands with reference to Laos yeah, uh, and Indonesia, and uh, yes. <coughs> All right, this is a uh, criticism from the left. Uh, from the far right, uh, this whole idea is not acceptable either. So here, uh, those of us in the middle are sort of catching it from both sides at the same time. <laughs> yeah. um, look, the, what I found out in my book is that you know none of the above is true. 
None of the above is true. Kennedy isn't um, isn't clean in this thing. We've already discussed on your program here how he deepened our commitment, uh, how he tried to hide it from the American people, and and shortly I propose that we get into in some detail um, this record of his public statements and all that. But uh, let's debunk one myth here. Kennedy was no pinko, soft on on communism, and afraid to stand up to Khrushchev. After all, in 1961. Uh, when Khrushchev ordered the Berlin Wall put up and tried to cordon off Berlin, Kennedy's response was to drive a huge, he, not personally, but to order a huge task force of tanks, American tanks, drove right across uh, the heartland of East Germany into Berlin. Okay? Not a, uh, I mean, message received in Moscow, okay? We came eyeball to eyeball, and there was no, uh, no doubt about it. If they wanted to, to go to war, uh, so, so be it. Um, in 1962, you have in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, we came to the brink of nuclear war. Kennedy put his foot down. Uh, this president was not afraid uh, to go to war. But here, the one thing you have to understand is that, for example, Havana, sense of you know sending in uh, American combat forces was no Berlin. We weren't sending tanks into into Havana under this president. And for Kennedy, certainly Saigon was no Berlin. And it wasn't even a Havana. He said back in 1961, if we're not going to send troops to, to Cuba, why should we send them to, to Vietnam? To which the chairman of the Joint Chiefs responded, well, we still think we should send them in, in, into Cuba. So let's be clear about uh, one thing. Kennedy um, was a president during the Cold War, and uh, he was not afraid to uh, take on this, this burden as it was perceived and necessary to go, to go through and, and confront uh, the advance of, of, of the communist here or there. But he was much more selective than others would have been about where the, it was necessary to do this. Berlin was clearly a case where the, the employment of American ground forces uh, was something he was prepared to do, but not in Vietnam. So it, it, it's, it doesn't help. It does not inform the, the, the debate to say, uh, well, you know, everyone says uh, because... You know, if we talk about Kennedy pulling out, then you're saying, you know, he was soft on communism. That does not inform this, this discussion. And as I've said repeatedly, uh, there was never a question about using American resources uh, to help the Vietnamese win. That was, there was no argument about that. The question was always how to do that and whether or not to turn that into an American war and send American combat divisions over there to do the job. And that was the argument. That was the issue. And from the very beginning, the answer from Kennedy was always no, no matter how many arguments were put before him. And it, by the time of his death, as he began to understand that this was a losing proposition, uh, he became convinced that, we would, uh, that, that the war was not viable. Americans were coming home in body bags, and that we would have to get out. Now... Um, the other part, I think, of what you were saying, um, you know, the, uh, white, this idea, of, if we discuss this subject, or if we advance this idea that Kennedy was withdrawing, somehow whitewashes him. Hogwash. Well, that's not it, at all what we're doing. All we're doing is talking about the facts here. Um, and the facts show that Kennedy uh, himself uh, was uh, engaging in, in duplicitous behavior. Um, there's no question, but he finds out. Uh, I argue as early as early '63, if not if not sooner, in late '62, that this is a losing proposition, and he does not have the the political courage to take it on before the election. So we're going to to stay. We're going to we're going to begin to withdraw forces, but we're going to stay basically until the election, so that he can get reelected. I argue in my book he should have taken his case to the people. If he felt that strongly about it, um, he had the responsibility as the President of the United States, to put that before the American public. Um, now, this is rather harsh criticism, and maybe he would have done that. There are some collateral evidence that he intended to do so during the campaign and debate Goldwater on it. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, in 1963, not wait till the election campaign, but when he knew, uh, is when he should have taken his case to the public, and not all this secrecy about NSAM 263 and the withdrawal order. In fact, as I see it, uh, and now we're going to move, uh, you know, uh, well, some combination of fact and, and theory here on my part, because uh, you know, one can only guess exactly 
uh, what is in his mind. Um, it appears that his withdrawal plan uh, has essentially three main components to it by early 63. Um, and this would be coincident, by the way, with the uh, famous, often quoted uh, statements to, uh, to Senator Mansfield uh, that he was going to withdraw and to his aide uh, O'Donnell. This would be in the spring of 1963. By that time, it, um, his, his plans to withdraw had really three components. In the first place, uh, he would have to wait until after the election because he feared provoking uh, another Joe McCarthy Red Scare from the right. Secondly, he was being criticized uh, by Hickenlooper, Fulbright, uh, Mansfield, and another of, of other uh, senators uh, for getting us bogged down. So this, the function of um, the 1,000-man withdrawal, uh, apart from uh, you know that we don't uh, that we're turning over the war effort, was intended to uh, show. Uh, these critics that, in fact, our withdrawal plan was not just lip service, but was real. We were, we were going to start doing it right away. Uh, so the, the two components of the plan there are intended to, um, to avoid getting uh, smacked from the right and uh, getting smacked from the left. And, act and actually, you know, when Nixon did it later, he took a page right out of Kennedy's book. Nixon trickled some guys out before the election and then pulled the plug afterwards. All right, same thing Kennedy intended to do. Now... One of the problems was how do you how do you do this uh, this with war, draw of a thousand guys if we're losing the war, it ends up provoking the same sort of uh, outcry from the right that if he pulled everybody out before the camp uh, the election campaign anyway, so um, he pulls a little judo move here that that deception we talked about in sixty two uh, hiding the failure of the battlefield which was intended to forestall an early decision on withdrawal is now used by the president to justify precisely that that withdrawal. Um, so that's really the third component. Uh, he's going. He's going to. He's not going to contest as he should have done, uh, and should have gone public, uh, allowed the truth to come out about how bad the war was going, um, and why, and instead um, use it as uses it as a sort of cover to get through to the election. Um, and allow to, so we can we can trickle a thousand guys out under an optimistic scenario. Now you see what I find objectionable in all this is the lack of candor. Um, when is it permissible? Even if Kennedy was going to pull us out of Vietnam, however noble that might have been, when is it permissible for a president uh, to lie or deceive the American public with respect to his intent with war and peace and where the lives of American soldiers on the battlefield are concerned? I submit never. If one president can, can lie about uh, withdrawing, another can lie about going in. And in that regard, I've always thought that Kennedy's problem was to disguise the withdrawal and Johnson's was to disguise an intervention. If you remember uh, how Johnson conducted himself in the campaign of 64, I'll never send American combat, I'll never send American boys to Asia and all that. <clears throat> so you see, um, in discussing this subject, uh, we're not making an attempt to whitewash Kennedy here. Kennedy uh, has as his own um, faults in the way he conducted this. But let's be clear about one thing. Kennedy was withdrawing at the time of his death, um, probably would have continued that policy, and never, ever would have put combat troops in Vietnam. This we know because of the record in 1961, when pra in every argument that could be made was made and laid before him. It would have been much easier for him to do it when the size of the Viet Cong was smaller than it was in 64, when he wasn't facing an election, much easier. Um, so maybe I've gone on too long again. No, you can't do that because you're the interviewee. Uh, I'm going to come out of left field on this one, and uh, you'll probably never hear this question again, But and I wasn't even going to bring it up, but in reviewing uh, your book, I noticed there is one, one of the pictures, is the only... Uh, picture featuring a single individual. It's a portrait of Major General Edward Lansdale, 1963, official U.S. Uh, Air Force photograph. Lansdale uh, has been mentioned by two people that we've had on the program on live or tape, uh, by Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, who was Mr. X in the movie, and by Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Greitz, uh, the most highly decorated Vietnam commander 
a Green Beret commander. Uh, Fletcher Prouty says that uh, in the famous picture of the three tramps uh, in back of Dealey Plaza, and the, who were the so-called tramps in new shoes and uh, nice haircuts, who were uh, taken by the so-called Dallas police and then disappeared. In one of those pictures, there's a picture of a man walking the opposite way back to the camera, and he has a, I think it was a characteristic posture that L. Fletcher Prouty looked at that and said, why, that's General Lansdale. And he wasn't positively positive, so he showed it to a dozen people who knew Lansdale, showed him the picture of this guy walking by the tramps back to the camera saying, who is this? And he said, every case, it was identified as Lansdale. That's from Colonel Prouty. Then from Colonel Greitz, um, Colonel Greitz has been, uh, uh, has organized and taken part in assassination uh, operations, and he says, based on his experience, he feels he uh, can pretty well identify the fingerprint of people who organize these operations. And uh, he feels that the, I think it's called the first the GQ-1 of the Kennedy hit team, he identifies 10 shooters and assistants headed by General Lansdale. Now, you don't discuss this specifically in your book, but Lans, uh, of course, but Lansdale does play a definite uh, large role in JFK and Vietnam. And I wonder if you could discuss this. Sure. I'm sorry for coming. <laughs> this is a, probably a, out of the a left field question, but it's something that we have been discussing over the months on this program. Well, that's not a problem. I have a lot of material in my book about Lansdale in Vietnam. Um, in, in regard to... Um, what is not in my book, uh, with respect to you know what you just mentioned, and of course in the movie um, that is Lansdale in there, the, the, his nameplate is partially obscured by some item on the desk, but you can see the E very clearly. Um, you know whether or not you can make the case that that's Lansdale there in Dealey Plaza in that photo by by the back of the head. Uh, you know, I guess we'll have to defer to. To Colonel Prouty's judgment, uh, he worked with Lansdale for him and with him. Um, that's fairly tenuous. But uh, I happen to know that Lansdale intended to go to Texas in November. That's part of the historical record. With that much we do know. Um, whether or not he was in, in Dallas is another question. Uh, very speculative. But nonetheless, uh, he was headed in that direction or intended to go down there. All right? So I'll throw out that tidbit and I would... Before we get off, I hope you give me um, uh, Gritz's phone number because I'd like to share some of that information with him and tell him where we can go find more about it. Um, can do. Uh, the Green Beret Colonel you were talking about. Yes, I, I can do that. Fine. What I think uh, about Lansdale and Vietnam is this. Edward Lansdale, you know, he has a long, sort of celebrated uh, covert action operator uh, type history. It's uh, several books written and uh, about it, um, but it goes back to the Philippines and, and uh, some quite creative uh, techniques he developed there in, in combating insurgencies. Um, he his talents were employed early on in the in the American uh, Vietnam experience, uh, right after Geneva and the French failure, and we began to to uh, take over more of the sort of responsibility for helping uh, um, the South Vietnamese uh, government. Lansdale uh, was in Vietnam as early as 1954-55. In, in, a, in a large sense, I think it, it's not untrue to say that the birth uh, of that country had a lot to do with this man. Um, he was there at, at, at the creation. He saved Diem's neck uh, more than once, twice, maybe three or four times. Um, kept him in power. Diem owed his political existence to, to Lansdale. Um, Lan for, for Lansdale, over the course of the 50s, Vietnam became a very special thing to him. South Vietnam, I should say. And it's survival. Um, 
he came back to Washington in the late 50s and returned on a trip for the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense to assess the uh, the situation, which was rapidly deteriorating. You see, Diem was basically an autocratic dictator um, who uh, had more of, uh, of a fight on his hands than than just the uh, the communist uh, communist soldiers in 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 the jungles. He by his policies, he had managed to alienate by the time Kennedy became president, uh, virtually the, the entire educated urban middle class in South Vietnam, and had uh, resorted to increasingly draconian uh, measures, imprisoning his opposition, uh, closing down the press, a number of things. So Lansdale went back out and took a look at the situation and came back and said, things are really bad, and there are a number of things we need to do. And in fact, this is the first report uh, Kennedy ever saw on Vietnam, was Lansdale's report. Uh, Lansdale also had in mind at that time um, getting rid of the ambassador, Ambassador uh, Durbrow at the time, and, and he wanted that position for himself. Uh, this may not be a fact. Uh, there, uh, it, that may be a theory, but it's a fairly well-supported one. Um, there's a, not a lot of evidence, and I won't go into it now. It's in my book, and there are other people that suggested it, uh, including uh, high, you know former high officials. Um, uh, they felt at the time that that's what Lansdale had in his mind, and and Kennedy sort of uh, buys into this, and that's why my my book opens with a prologue, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, he, he sort of swallows the Lansdale's report whole and decides to, decides to fire Durbrow and uh, to replace him uh, with Lansdale as early 61. Um, over the course of those first months, um, Kennedy changes his mind. Um, a number of people play a role in this. Uh, the most crucial one is Dean Rust, the Secretary of State. Uh, parallel to the to the decision of what to do, who to replace the ambassador with, is also you know what are we going to do in Vietnam? And there's a structure set up to decide uh, to make proposals to to submit to the president, and that's a Vietnam task force. And Lansdale ends up being the operations officer of that task force and constructing those first proposals. Um, in the context of the failure in Laos in March April and the failure uh, at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba in, on 19 April. Um, the president decides uh, against intervening in Laos. And the Bay of Pigs failure was, was crucial in that because he was still considering it. He had turned it down up to that point, but um, there was virtually unanimous uh, uh, agreement among his advisors that he should intervene in Laos with combat forces. Well, um, he had extreme doubts about doing so. He wanted to pursue a non-military political solution there. And after the failure in Bay of Pigs, what he perceived to be terrible, awful advice uh, by both the CIA and the, and the Joint Chiefs in that crisis, uh, that made up his mind for him in a hurry. Uh, and that was it. No, more, no chance in Laos. Virtually within hours of their perception, and we know exactly when the Joint Chiefs perceived that Kennedy would not execute in Laos because... Uh, we have cables that were sent out to the commanders in the Pacific uh, uh, where just precisely those words were used. Uh, we fear we will not execute in Laos. We find that within 24 hours of the perception that Kennedy would not intervene in Laos, um, there are some crucial changes made to the Vietnam Task Force report being sent to the president on what to, to do in Vietnam. Up to that point, there was no mention of sending U.S. combat troops to Vietnam. Now, after uh, it was decided, or the perception uh, took hold that Kennedy would not execute in Laos, an annex was drafted for the Vietnam Task Force report. There were three versions of that annex, uh, two written by uh, Colonel Black, who, who worked um, under the uh, under Secretary of Defense, and a third, uh, the, the second uh, draft. Um, uh, was the crucial one, because that second draft is the one that, that mentions a uh, uh, U.S. troop commitment to Vietnam. That second draft was, was authored by Edward Lansdale. Shortly after this, Lansdale's role will disappear immediately, because Dean Rusk, um, at least according to Lansdale, um, uh, as he found out in 1963, Rusk had tendered his resignation to Kennedy if Lansdale were to be allowed to 
to continue such a prominent role in Vietnam policy. And basically, he was removed, and it broke his heart. Vietnam was his baby. It was his obsession. And uh, he was taken, taken out, you know, just taken off the job. He was allowed to play in the McNamara Taylor, excuse me, in the Rostow Taylor trip at the end of '61. Um, but it was not a very major role because Taylor didn't like him, and he didn't like Taylor. Um, in any event, uh, when he came back from from that trip, uh, he was removed completely and forever uh, from any active participation in in uh, Vietnam policy, and put in charge of Operation Mongoose, which were covert actions against Cuba um, to topple Castro and his regime there. So for the so the rest of the Kennedy presidency, Lansdale is is in charge and running um, uh, operations against Cuba. Of course, his interest in Vietnam never wanes, and he he writes about it to his friends. He he's working in the Pentagon. He reads the cables and so on. But by the time we get to the summer of 1963, uh, when plans are afoot um, to uh, you know, as far as the, the, the coup, and there is American complicity in that, but it's not as direct as some people have made it out to be. But it certainly is there, as these plans unfold for a coup against Diem. Um, Lansdale is cut off in the Pentagon, not allowed to see any of the cable traffic, and neither are any of the people that are close to Lansdale. They're all cut off. So anyway, uh, there it is. There's a, a number of uh, very interesting uh, uh, chapters, tidbits, uh, episodes there in the life of Edward Lansdale in Vietnam. And uh, certainly uh, he uh, uh, was not happy uh, with, I, wouldn't sus- I would suspect, with being removed from uh, what he, he loved the most. So he would have a grudge against Kennedy. Yeah, he, he might have a grudge against Kennedy. I never saw anything in, in, in his personal letters which said that specifically, but I've laid it out for you as best that I can. Okay. Um, in general, what do you expect your book, uh, JFK and Vietnam, to contribute to the uh, current resurgence of interest in this uh assassination coup d'etat of uh, 30 years ago? Well, a couple of things. Number one, um, if, what I learned, if nothing else, from this whole project is that preconceived notions tend not to hold up under close scrutiny. I'm afraid everyone's going to have to let go of their baggage on this. Uh, and, and sort of... Can we not be a little more patient here? Uh, this is a serious subject. Well, it's the watershed of, of American history um, after World War II. I, I think uh, we need to be working very hard on opening the files. And I submit that, that once we do get access to all the information, there will be a lot less theories going around uh, and, and more, of the, more of the facts. Um, so that... I guess I would like to, I would hope that uh, we become uh, more objective, that more people become involved, uh, particularly those uh, academics that have been afraid to take this one on. Um, and I guess also uh, I would like to see the, the level of, of, of debate um, go forward. I think, I hope that my book has, uh, and I said in the end there, you know, I could have waited longer. I could have waited for, for more documents. I could have done more polishing, and I'm sure I've made lots of mistakes. Um, but by going forward now, uh, I hope to, to like, as I said earlier, get, get some, uh, some things straight in Oliver's movie, and also uh, to make available to other researchers all these documents that I've found. I've found. Uh, about 15,000 pages of them, and done interviews with uh, countless numbers of people who were involved in Vietnam policy and taped them and uh, transcribed them. And all this this stuff is going to be available to the public in the Kennedy libraries. It'll be called the John Newman Papers. And I may have been the silliest person in the world and, and totally misread everything and made and everything I said is a mistake, but at least it'll be there for other people to use and work with. So I hope that... Uh, we push this whole thing forward a little bit. Uh, Oliver Stone's movie has been accused of um, being uh, not much short of a crime by a lot of people, by I think probably a majority of the press, and uh, and being uh, at least 
highly inaccurate in everything uh, except maybe the spelling of his own name or something in the title. What what was your specific contribution? Uh, where are your fingerprints in, in this film? All right, as I alluded to before, when I first met Oliver, I told him um, two things, uh, two conditions upon uh, that, under which I would help him and consult with him, advise him. Number one was I wouldn't discuss the assassination with him. God knows he had enough people doing that. Uh, and I don't feel, um, as an historian, I have any competence to do that. I haven't researched it. Um, and he agreed to that, and we stuck to that. Secondly, uh, we mentioned that I am active military, and I said that I didn't want that used in any way to promote his film. And he honored that. He has not uh, tried to, to uh, suggest that uh, he has some army person uh, uh, who had access to secret information and... And now he's got the truth. He's never uh, used that at, at all. And the, my credentials in, in, in v, the Vietnam Arena come as an academic. And uh, Oliver honored that also. On that basis, we proceeded. Uh, my fingerprints in this film are uh, in several areas. Uh, the, the, the screenplay, as I got it in, in, um, in the spring, had a number of errors, uh, some minor, some not so minor, on, on these ensigns we discussed. They're highly technical. Um, as most people don't know how to, uh, they're, they're just too quick. They don't take their time like Peter Dale Scott did years ago. Um, I managed to, uh, and, and, and all my advice was followed where I said, hey, look, you know, this is not right. You've got to change this because that's wrong. We got those those things straight. A number of, um, uh, some material was introduced uh, that uh, alludes to, uh, deception of, 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 of in, in terms of reporting on the battlefield situation. I'm sure you'll, you'll find that in there. In a broader sense, the, uh, the X character, which was originally based on Colonel Prouty, um, uh, was broadened and turned into a composite character to include the, my research and that, that which I shared w with him. So I am, in fact, a, a minor part of uh, Mr. X. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, the uh, book is JFK and Vietnam. It is out. Uh, it is in uh, the bookstores now. And uh, JFK and Vietnam by John M. Newman, Deception, Intrigue, and the Struggle for Power. And one of the quotations on the jacket is from Peter Dale Scott. Uh, Newman's book exhaustively documents one of the m more explosive and suppressed stories of the road to the Vietnam War. Drawing on secret documents, interviews, and memoirs, Newman shows how for three years U.S. failures in Vietnam were masked by bureaucratic deceit and infighting with a dramatic denouement in the first days after the president's murder. It is both meticulous history and a cliffhanger. Peter Dale Scott. Thank you very much for staying up uh, or getting up in the middle of the night, uh, which is now almost 5 o'clock for you, uh, to discuss uh, JFK and Vietnam. And I personally thank you. I haven't been able to to uh, read the book uh, completely in the few hours I've had it, but it is a amazing, uh, detailed book, uh, highly specialized and cannot be lightly dismissed by anybody, and I think it has raised the level of debate and discussion on the entire subject of uh, JFK, Vietnam, and the assassination. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, uh, meeting some of your listening audience out there. Okay, we've been talking with John M. Newman. The book, again, now available, JFK and Vietnam, Deception, Intrigue, and the Struggle for Power.